If you've never touched a line of Unity's shader lab language, or HLSL, then this is the place to start. We're going to learn how to write your very first shader, which will just display a basic color on Unmesh. It's like the shader version of Hello World. I've chosen to use Unity 6.0, and I'll be working with Universal Render Pipeline. Unfortunately, unlike ShaderGraph, the shader libraries for each render pipeline differ quite a lot. So it's really for the best that you choose a pipeline upfront like this. Let's start in a fresh project and right click in the project view and select Create, Shader, Unlit Shader, and name the file Hello World. Why not? When you open it up, you'll see, well, a bunch of garbage, really. This template was designed in ancient times for the built in render pipeline, so I'm just going to delete everything. Instead, let's write the shader from first principles. Fair warning, code based shaders come with a lot of boilerplate code, but luckily, we will be able to copy most of this between shaders, so don't fret too much. I promise that this clicks over time as you write more shaders, but this video is gonna involve a lot of talking and I can't really avoid it, I'm so sorry. We will begin by writing code in a Unity specific language called ShaderLab. ShaderLab is mostly there to feed high level global parameters to the shader. ShaderLab commands are rarely about the minute details of how a shader draws stuff, they are more often like I want this shader to use transparency, or this shader path will render depth information. The first shader lab command is literally just the word shader, followed by the name of the shader in quotes, then a set of curly braces in which we'll put the rest of the code. This shader name is a file path used by Unity when you select the shader used by a material, so we can call it something like basics slash hello world. And then later, when we create a material, we will find the Hello World option under the Basics folder. Next, the first shader lab block we will put in the shader is called Properties, which are the tweakable settings that you will see on a material. Properties are things like float or integer numbers, colors, textures, vectors, and so on. We write each property on a new line inside this block but the syntax is a bit strange when you first encounter it. I want this shader to just display a color, so we can define a color property here. First, we specify the name of the property, which conventionally uses an underscore followed by Pascal case, which just means all words have a capitalized first letter with no gaps. I am going to call this underscore base color. Then we open a set of parentheses and uh, write the property name in quotes. Yeah, this is a bit weird. The first name is a shader friendly name, which we'll use later within this file. And this second name is a human friendly name that will be displayed on the material. I'm going to call it base color. Then we have a comma and the type of the property. As mentioned, we can use types like float, integer, 2D for textures, but handily, there is a special color type which is perfect here. After the parentheses, we can specify a default value using the equals sign and then the value in a second set of parentheses. Colors have four components, red, green, blue, alpha slash transparency, and in Shaderland, each one takes a floating point value between zero and one. So to make the default value white, I'll put one for each component. This is the only property we'll need for this shader. After properties, the next block is called subshader, and this is where we can start to specify some of that global behavior I mentioned earlier. Inside the subshader, let's add a block called tags, which contains key value pairs of data, which determine how and when to use a given subshader or pass. Thanks, Unity documentation. We will add three tags. The first key is the render pipeline tag, which we can use to restrict usage of this shader to a particular pipeline. The corresponding value will be universal pipeline, which we put after an equals sign. If we were writing an HDRP shader, we would put HD render pipeline instead. On the next line, the next tag is render type, 
which we mostly use to specify if the object is opaque or transparent. We'll stick with opaque for now. Finally, we need the Q tag, which determines when in the render loop that the object gets rendered. Unity has a defined order that it renders things in, and the geometry value means that our object renders alongside all the opaque objects and before all the transparent ones. We'll see other possible values like transparent and alpha test in future tutorials. The final shader lab command we will use is called pass, which signifies the start of a shader pass, or more descriptively, Unity is going to draw the entire object once to the screen using some shader code. Shaders typically use more than one pass for different purposes like drawing to the depth buffer or shadow casting or light mapping, but we're only going to use one for this shader. Inside the pass block, we are going to leave ShaderLab behind and start writing in a new language called HLSL, High Level Shader Language. HLSL isn't Unity specific, it's the language used by Microsoft's DirectX graphics API for writing shaders, and it's here that we start saying how stuff should get drawn. Don't worry if you're using something other than DirectX, as Unity can use this code for other graphics APIs too. We can initiate an HLSL code block by writing HLSL program in all caps, and we close it off with a corresponding end HLSL block. HLSL is a C-like language, so if you're comfortable with any language like C, c -sharp, Java, and so on, its syntax is hopefully going to feel familiar, although there are a few weird quirks. First, we need to talk about what the shader will actually be doing. It's a shader's job to work out where our mesh should be drawn on the screen during a step called the vertex shader, it's called that because it takes each vertex of the mesh and transforms it from a representation where each vertex position is relative to the mesh pivot point, known as object space, to a representation where each vertex is relative to the screen viewport called clip space. Believe me, that's oversimplified, but that's all we need to know here. Then there is a second step called the fragment shader, which colors each pixel. In between the two stages, there is a step called rasterization, which is handled automatically and turns your mesh into individual pixels or fragments, which can then be shaded individually. We will write a vertex shader, which automatically runs on every vertex, and a fragment shader, which is run on each pixel. First, we should include some useful library functions, which will do some of the heavy lifting for us. I am going to import the core.hlsl file located inside the URP shader library using the hash include directive. You'll probably use this include file in every URP shader that you write. Next, we need to define the shader properties used inside this shader. This may seem redundant since we already wrote the properties block at the top of the file, but as we will see in later tutorials, there are properties that we can use directly in shader lab without using them in HLSL, and there are properties that we can specify in HLSL without using the properties block. We use a C-like syntax for this. First is the type, float4, for a four-component vector of floating point numbers. Then it's name, which is the one we wrote earlier with the underscore in front of it. Then we need to define what information gets passed to each invocation of the vertex shader. With that in mind, I will create a struct short for structure, to hold all the variables which get passed from the mesh to the vertex shader. You can name this anything you want, but most resources you find online will call this either app data, vertex input, or attributes, and I'm going to stick with calling it app data for this series. As I mentioned, the vertex shader will operate on each vertex of the mesh and we need to know its position so that we can transform the vertex to the correct position on screen. Therefore, the only variable in the struct will be the position, which is a float4, and I'll name it position OS to make it clear that this is in object space. We also need to use some special HLSL syntax called a semantic so that the graphics API knows what data to pull from the mesh. To the graphics API, the name position OS is meaningless. 
But if we give it the position semantic after a colon, it will know that I want to pull the vertex position data into this variable. Also, make sure to end the strut closing brace with a semicolon. It's really easy to miss that out, especially if you're coming from C-sharp where you don't need to do that after a strut. After the app data strut, let's also define what information is passed from the vertex shader to the fragment shader. We'll use another struct, which conventionally is named v2f, vertex output, or variums, but I'm going to stick with v2f. Inside the struct, we only need the clip space position, so I'll put float for position cs. And this time, we need another semantic, sv underscore position. This one is important because it signifies to the rasterizer which position data to use when converting the mesh into pixels. Finally, we are ready to write the vertex shader. This is a function which uses C-like syntax, so we need the return type, which is v2f, then the name of the function, I'm going to call it vert, and then the parameters in parentheses. The only parameter is an app data, which I'll call v for vertex. Inside the function, we'll create a new v2f called o for output. This is a pattern that you'll see quite often when creating new structs, where we cast a zero to the struct type, and we do this to make sure that each member of the struct has a default value. You won't always be explicitly setting the value for each member of the struct in your vertex shader, so it's good to get into the practice of setting a default value to avoid errors. Next, we need to apply the transformation between object space positions and clip space positions. This is why we included the core.hlsr file, as it provides a very useful function that we can use here called transform objects to h clip. We can just pass in the input position os and assign the result to the output position cs. Finally, we just return the v2f struct instance. After the vertex shader comes the fragment shader. We can set it up similar to the vertex shader function. The return type is now float4, because we are just outputting a color to the screen. The function name will be frag, and the only parameter is a v2f, which I'm going to name i for input. The difference here is that we need to use another semantic called sv underscore target, so that the graphics API knows where to bind the color output. SV underscore target essentially refers to the screen output color. Inside the fragment shader function, we technically have access to the clip space position of the pixel, but we don't need to do anything with it here to make the shader work. It's just nice to have some effects. The rasterizer already dealt with positioning the pixel for us. With that in mind, all we need to do is return the base color property straight away. The final thing we need to do in the shader is to tell the graphics API which function to use of the vertex and fragment shaders, as the names vert and frag don't mean anything special by themselves. To do that, let's go right back to the top of the HLSL program block and write hash pragma vertex vert to assign the vert function as the fragment shader, and hash pragma fragment frag to use the frag function as the fragment shader. With that, we are done with the shader file. Let's return to the scene view and try out our new shader. I've added a basic sphere mesh to the scene, and I will now create a material using create rendering material, and assign our hello world shader to it by clicking the shader dropdown and selecting basics hello world. Now we can choose any color we want to show up on our sphere. We can also duplicate the sphere and the material, and then use separate colors on the materials to make each mesh a different color. That's the power of shader properties. We can write a shader effect once, and then create any number of materials with different settings to create wildly different effects with just one shader. Or just change the color, I guess. Congratulations on writing your first shader. I know the syntax is weird, but you've taken the first step and it only gets more exciting from here. If I have any advice before the next tutorial comes out, I'd say you should make a few mistakes. Intentionally mistype something or leave out a keyword or a semantic here or there. Miss out a semicolon, use an invalid tag. 
With shaders, you're gonna see many weird errors, and it's not always gonna be clear exactly where or what the problem is. So I think it's worth spending just a little bit of time getting a feel for them. I won't have time to cover every possible mistake and error message in this series, so unfortunately you'll need to just google error messages from time to time. In the next part of the series, we will learn how to map textures to each part of the mesh and then draw the texture on the mesh surface. Until then, have fun making shaders.